Hi and welcome to the CPA exam preparation webinar. My name's Courtney and it's Friday 14th of October. It was uh, Thursday the 13th when we first did this, but Gremlins took over. So we re-recorded it and here it is. So the agenda for this session is focused on getting you ready for the exam and it starts with guessing the exam questions. Why do we do that? Because if you read the study guide without trying to think how am I going to be examined, you're not studying in the right way. So we look at how to guess the question, then we look at how to deconstruct a question because if you understand what the question is doing, you've got a much better chance of getting that right. Then we're looking at the written answers. What should you be doing here? Now, for those of you doing electives, not so relevant, but everyone has to do these at some point in time. Then we look at the key study approaches right from the start of semester up to now. What can you do now with only a few days to go? And your final preparation. So that's the agenda for this session. Now, what I'd like to do before we start is uh, just do a few acknowledgements and thank you for everyone who's joined us. We've, we've hit over 3,000 students, which is just extraordinary. So we, we're really thankful for your support. Uh, we've had nearly 100,000 YouTube views and over 100,000 on Vimeo. So people are studying and watching this new way. If you check out these stats, 239 days worth of, of research and effort and studying and learning, which is just extraordinary. So we're, we're incredibly pleased about that. And we've managed to pick up our customers now or students from 25 different countries, which is absolutely thrilling since we launched in 2015. So keep telling people about us, keep uh, using us, keep giving us feedback. We're gonna keep on improving as we go. So for those of you who uh, have saw this last night or are watching again, we were saying that we've got early birds and value packs available. There were 164 available last night and we've had fabulous support. So we're down to 137 to go. So uh, my encouragement to you is to, to find out more about these early birds, these value packs and get on board. The amazing thing is you're gonna get the lowest price that you've ever seen. So what we've got is for students who've done ethics and governance, you'll only know full focus but what we normally have, this is normally $450. It's the live webinars, the practice exams, absolutely everything. And uh, if you check this out, if, you, if you're signing up for all five, you're literally getting uh, $1, and, under $1,250 for the whole thing. And if you look at the difference between pack four and five, you're only paying a very, very small amount for that final subject. So check it out. If you're only after one subject, you've only got one or two to go, sign up. And, and uh, what we really like is the more people who sign up early, the more we can uh, create resources, put on new staff, keep on growing and keep on improving and giving you more support. So a few people have been asking me, well, what if I don't know what I'm studying next? So the way it works is you buy your pack, your, your use, and you can use them whenever you want. You can choose your subjects whenever you enroll. So semester one, 2017, semester two, you can use them one subject per semester or two. We've even had two students who did three subjects in two semesters in a row and completed the program within a 12 month period. We do a free rollover. So if you fail or defer, what you've got is access until you get through. So you do a subject with us. If you don't pass or you need to defer, we will roll you over. We don't charge you extra. It's our job to help and support you. You have to do the work, but if you haven't got through, we don't think it's fair for you to pay again. And you get to lock in pretty much the lowest price. Anyone who's been in knowledge equity for a while will see that the price we, we keep on putting it up as we grow, as we add more resources. So you will never see a price as low as this, especially if you look at the four packs and five packs, they're extraordinary. So what are the key differences between exam ready and full focus? So the main difference is full focus has live webinars, exam ready, you get the recordings. And of course, with the live webinars comes that opportunity for the chat box and live Q and A. So if you need some to, to keep on track, if you need a, a regular time every week to turn up, then full focus is what you should be aiming for. But if you're happy to study in your own time and you have extra discipline, or, or if you live in a time zone that's not near Australia, then I think you, you should aim for the exam ready. And another key difference is written exam feedback comes with the full focus package in the core subjects. Everyone gets exam feedback, especially on the MCQs, but with our exam ready, you'll be able to compare your answers against the marking guide, whereas full focus receives written feedback. So that explains the price difference there and the experience. All right, thank you for uh, your time on that. Let's look at exam preparation. And when does it start? It starts at the start of semester, and this is something people miss. They kind of read, they kind of study, and then it's like 10 days before, and it's like, how do I get ready for the exam? Too late. Well, well, hopefully not for you now, but next semester especially, start promptly, start early. As I said before, guessing the question, deconstruction, the answer. So let's look at 
guessing the question. What we start off with is, do we know what the module ratings are? Guess what? Your exams are going to be based on the module ratings. So if you don't understand the module ratings, you are going to not be able to know where to focus your attention. Then within the modules, CK so give you significant guidance. They tell you the important areas. They want you to learn these. They're not trying to trick you or trap you. They want you to study it, learn it, and demonstrate it. So if you know your objectives and your module ratings, you can start guessing the questions. Then we ask ourselves as we read the study guide, can it be a multiple choice question? It might be two pages of, of general discussion. Sometimes we call that fluff. So is it fluff, is it explanatory, or is it very detailed and specific? Are there dot points included? Are there key headings and terminologies? The more specific the content, the more likely it can be an MCQ. Now, it could also be a written answer if there's arguments and debates or legal issues or ethical issues or strategic issues. But if we know our module ratings, we can then look up each module and say, how many marks do you think we'll get? Then we look at the objectives and we say, how are we going to be examined inside this module? And all of a sudden, it starts popping up. Let me give you some examples. Well, I've started off with financial risk management as an example for the study portions. Now, in this example, what we'll see is the first four modules are, are roughly about 10% marks. So if you have an example, I believe it's about seven of the MCQs, you're going to get seven marks in, in module one, seven in module three, seven in module four. But if you haven't studied hard, and guess what? When, when people look at their scaled results, it normally is module one and two pretty good, module three not so good. And if you haven't made it through, it's normally the later modules when you've run out of time. So have a look at, you have to put your attention in the second half of this semester because that's where the big 14% weightings are. And, and that helps you decide where do I need to put my attention. Now, and another example is uh, contemporary business issues. And you'll see that module four is the most important here up at 19%. So a lot of students, when they come to revision, they go to module one. And the, the problem with that is you've already read it. Yes, that's good, but it's often not worth very much. For example, in advanced tax, it's only worth 5% and it's 100 pages. Other modules are also 100 pages, but they're worth 12%. So you've got to choose wisely where to spend your time. The other thing is in some subjects, and now you can see strategic management accounting, check this out. 30% of your study time, 30% of the exam is going to be on module four. If you cannot master this module, you're probably guaranteed to fail. So when it comes to revision time, and, and this is a mistake I often see, people go right back to module one, check this out. Why would you devote 10 or 20 more hours here when the key benefit is here? Now, I'm not saying you ignore module one, you should have mastery across all the study guide, but you need to plan carefully and sensibly about where to devote your attention. So that's the first part of guessing what my exam is going to look like. The second part is to break the module down into a particular component. So here we've got, I've, I've grabbed financial reporting objectives, and, and you could grab this from any topic, but the first seven objectives are about explaining the role of financial reporting and its purpose in the conceptual framework. So if financial reporting module one is worth a certain uh, percentage according to the weightings, you might get 10 marks here or eight marks. Well, expect eight marks and some of them are going to address this. So do we know the role of financial reporting? Have I read about providing useful information for decision makers, for the allocation of scarce resources? Do I know about my conceptual framework? Do I know about the key qualitative characteristics? Do I know about timeliness and the relevance and faithful verification? Can I explain them and use them and apply them in an example? If I can do that, then I can be confident asking the questions here. Now we chunk the objectives into, into their main themes. And then now what you do is you try and figure out how are they going to examine me here and here? How are they going to examine me in relation to professional judgment? Well, I get one or two questions there. Do I know the mixed measurement module uh, model? Can I answer a question here? Do I know the relevant criteria to determine materiality? All of a sudden, you can, if, if the, the exam is crafted properly and properly test the objectives, you can figure out a rough idea of what you're going to be examined on. Now, you won't know the exact question, but how nice is it to know that if you understand materiality, you're pretty confident in getting that question right. If you know the conceptual framework, you're going to get that right. So this is how we can be very strategic about getting through an exam. Start with the weightings, narrow it down to the objectives, and then check, make sure you've mastered it. 
The final step is to list each objective and test yourself against it and say, do I know this content? What kind of questions am I going to get? So you can list an objective at the top of the page and think about what kind of questions here. How much content is there? Is there 10 pages on this, 15? That will determine whether you might get one question or two or none. Now, sometimes this isn't going to work out perfectly. There might be an objective you know really well and zero questions, or one objective you're not very good at and you get a lot of questions. That's the nature of it, but at least you can be well prepared. So then we go on to, can it be an MCQ? So we've looked at the ratings, we've looked at the module objectives. Now we look at the nitty gritty of the text. The example up on the screen here comes ethics and governance module five. And the reason I've brought it up is there are four key drivers that are affecting environmental sustainability. All right, now whenever there is four of something, get excited because MCQs generally have four options. So if there's four, then that's really easy to write a question about. I could write a, a finding type question where it's just about knowing is it climate change or waste or pollution? Or you could get a scenario where you need to choose which is the most relevant issue. So as soon as there are dot points or key headings or key themes, you can start saying, how can they ask me a multiple choice question here? Multiple choice questions have to have a single correct answer. And therefore, if there's just discussion and it's very vague, that's good at understanding the material, but you've got to highlight the key areas where you might be tested. So that's stage one, guessing the exam question. Now, uh, and, and the example I gave last night as well was like, if you've seen the new coffees, you can get a, your, your coffee and your milk and your water and your sugar and the cup and you have to make it all yourself. You can deconstruct coffees, you can deconstruct desserts. Let's have a look at pulling apart multiple choice questions. What are they looking at? What are they trying to test? If you understand this, you've got more of a picture of how you're going to be examined. And this is all about hitting the exam calmly and with confidence. So most of the exam questions, if they were at this level, this is a Bloom's taxonomy type concept where the, the level of your knowledge grows and grows over time. So remembering is pretty easy stuff. It's like, oh, I can find that right page and there's the correct answer. If all your exam questions are here, you'd probably do extremely well, but that, they're not very good questions. They don't test you very hard because it just means you can find something. It doesn't mean you know it. Understanding is when you can really sort of explain it to someone else and, and use it a bit more wisely. Apply is when you can use it effectively, and that might be in terms of calculations and uh, choosing which are the right categories based on a set of case facts. Analyze is when you can look at some numbers or a scenario and say, this is good, this is bad, here are some problems. And then at the very top, these are the toughest questions, and this is what CPA aim to do, and, and sometimes they get this, sometimes it's a little bit easier, but creating synthesis evaluation, which is, here's a difficult scenario, what would you do? And sometimes there's no guidelines, there's no framework. So you might be asked to make recommendations, fix things. What should they do next? So part of a detailed question might be, can you do the calculations application? And then based on that, can you make recommendations for improvement in solving this problem? So you are going to have to expect difficult questions with long stories, uh, one or two paragraphs long, and they'll explain scenarios and you have to figure out what theory to apply and come to a conclusion. So, so whenever you hear someone say, oh, MCQs, they're so easy, they've done a silly exam where all of the other distractors, all the other options are wrong. In a CPA exam, the, the distractors are designed to distract, to not trick you, but capture your attention because they look plausible, because they look pretty good. So let's deconstruct. I talked about the easiest questions, as I said, the remember level, finding. Let me give you an example from Ethics and Governance Module 1. Which of the following is not an attribute of the profession? So what we have is a, is a list here, and we've pretty much been said there are attributes, here's a list, which one doesn't fit the list? So we've got, it's pretty simple, if you go and here's the examples from the study guide, and there are three that easily match up, okay, we have a systematic body of knowledge, ideal of service, application of professional judgment. So what's missing must be the correct answer and therefore it's very easy you don't even have to understand what this is about to get the answer right now it's unlikely you're going to see very many of these questions because they're a little bit too easy but if you get them enjoy them take advantage of them and get them right very quickly then there's the comprehend or understand type question 
once again, they're fixing governance as an example. Here's a little bit of a scenario. You can probably expect something quite a bit longer. And then you have to choose which theory or philosophy or item matches. So here we've got uh, professionals. Do they act in the public interest or are they really just selfish and greedy? What, what philosophy describes that more self-interested approach? Well, the traditional and functional view, they describe uh, the, the normal way of, of how we view a profession, more public interest and altruism. But then we get to monopoly and market control view. Now, this is what I talked about in terms of plausibility. All of these items are discussed in the study guide. Monopoly is discussed, but monopoly captures the concept here, but the, tech, the technical term is used is market control. And that's where people try and capture the market, get a monopoly on it, and get status and wealth and credibility. So you need to comprehend, you need to be able to read these case facts and then choose the classification that works. And if, if you can think about uh, quite a few examples of this will be management accounting where you have to choose a classification like a product life cycle or in uh, financial reporting, you need to be able to comprehend and understand something like your qualitative characteristics or your recognition criteria. So what about explain? This is going to that next level of difficulty. And here's an example where we tell you the facts. So the accounting profession, ethics, governance, one to one, has lost credibility. And one of the reasons is lack of audits of independence. Now, that's just a checklist item. Lack of audit of independence plus creative accounting plus other factors has meant a reduction in credibility. But now we have to go to the next level of explain why does this cause a loss of credibility? So you really have to understand this at a way that you can actually communicate it to someone else, normally in writing, sometimes in a multiple choice. So that's our explain question. Another example of explain question might be, explain the agency costs that arise in a particular situation, because we've got Samantha, the CEO, so now we're in ethics and governance module three. The board has asked Samantha to do something, and Samantha wants to take some, some decisions here. So what agency issues might come up? Well, you firstly have to be able to explain agency and then link it to these case facts. So you can see there's a little bit more complexity here. So you have to understand the materials quite well. Then we get to our application or apply type questions. And this is where, uh, in using ethics and governance again, we have our, here's a scenario, the M1 audit committee, uh, which was supposed to be fantastic, but things went wrong. So we need to read the case facts. And then how do we apply? Well, the study guide gives you a toolkit. In this case, it gives you the ASX principles, or it gives you the FRC code, or the OECD principles. You hold up the best practice, and you compare it, and you apply and say, in this case, we've got someone who's supposed to be independent getting $72,000 worth of consulting work. Their independence is compromised. We have someone here getting undisclosed payments. Independence compromised again. Here we've got someone doing campaign donations. They're compromised. Here's someone who's regarded as being a little bit too old to continue to serve on the committee. So what we have here is apply by considering the situation and doing the case facts. So, so think about global strategy and leadership. You're going to get scenarios and tools and texts. There's PESL, there's five forces, there's balanced scorecard, there's ANSOS matrix. You need to take the theory, read the case facts, and apply it to come to a classification and a conclusion. Financial reporting, here's the accounting standard, here's the scenario, apply. So these types of questions can be expected a lot. Uh, in Ethics Governance Module 4, we've got this example of the advertisement. You've got an advertisement, it's been laboratory tested, and but the results are inconclusive. Now, imagine you came out with a great big advertisement, and, and this is based on real case law, it was based on fire extinguishers. So our new wonder cream is going to totally transform you, totally amazing. Has the company breached the law? Now, I don't expect you to know the answer right now, unless you're studying ethics and governance, but the key thing here is, can you apply the law? You firstly need to know the law and then systematically work through it. So what we need to do is, in this case, is it misleading and deceptive? We need to pick, pick the right issue and then we need to work through it systematically. Has there been, you know, is there a truthful impression or have we told the truth but not really conveyed the right impression? Will it deceive less informed people? Is it fair or is it deceptive? And then things that, that we shouldn't conclude are, you know, although I told the truth, it's been tested. You didn't tell the whole truth. There's a key omission there. And it's not a subjective statement. 
So puffery in this case doesn't exist. So you can see that application doesn't work unless you know that the law or the framework or the tool or the model that you have to use. So if you go through all of management accounting, it is full of tools and models. It's got the value chain, it's got PEST, it's got five forces, it's got um, activity-based costing, it's got performance measures and balance scorecards. If you know the theory, you have to apply it to the case facts. You must expect a huge number of questions in this area. Then we get to calculate, not relevant in the theory-based subjects, so not so relevant for the CBI, not so relevant for EEG, but definitely FRM, bit of SMA, sometimes in GSL, not really, and, uh, and financial reporting. So, so here's an example of a, a pre-webinar question we used in management accounting. You get a, a bunch of, you know, lots of donuts. It's very exciting to think about this. We're going to sell them. They have a cost. What's my break even? How much profit do I think I'm going to make? What's my contribution margin? We need to calculate. And as it says in the heading, a calculation question can also lead to application explaining and, and solving. So I calculate and the number tells me a story. Am I going to be profitable or am I in trouble? If I'm in trouble, explain why. Then solve. Give me three recommendations to fix this problem. And students get very, very stuck here. They, they don't know what to recommend. They, they can say, oh, I'm very good at the calculations. So that's the accountant as bookkeeper, the accountant as record keeper. But the accountant as business advisor has to do more than that. I've done these calculations. I think you're in trouble. Here are three strategies. This is my recommendation. That's what we need to be able to do. We need to be able to solve problems or use our professional judgment to improve things. So you can see how these questions interrelate. If, if you're in management accounting or financial reporting or global strategy and you're getting a written question, you might have to do some calculation and application, then get to explain what the issues are and what caused them and fix them and solve. So uh, here's an example of calculation and analysis from financial reporting. This is one of the Ashen's uh, warm-up questions. So if there's 15, what's the transaction price? What's the revenue? Uh, when will it be recognised? So you need to be able to calculate and interpret. So the numbers are here. Now, one of the key things about a calculation question, you might have to do quite a bit of work. And, and so this is going to take you a few more minutes than a simpler theory question. You need to balance your time carefully. So you need to make up time in the other areas so that you have time for the calculation and you need to be calm. You need to be systematic because it's very easy to make silly mistakes. And remember, there's distractors there to capture the unwary if you're not cautious. Finally, we get to solve, and I've hinted at these quite a bit. So solving, and, and here's an audit pre-webinar question. So if you haven't seen much of what we do in our webinars, what you've got is every week we give you something to really chew on the weekend before, so you're studying and reflecting and working, so you're prepared for the webinar. You don't just turn up and, and start learning from scratch. So here's a, a question that requires solving. We start looking at misstatements and likely risks, then assertions, but check this out. How will you gather audit evidence? It's up to you to start fixing this problem. What internal controls and what would you do to efficiently test? So we go from you know, simple uh, descriptions and application to solving the problem. Normally a solved question will be a written answer, but sometimes it's, it's a multiple choice question. So I hope that, that deconstruction gives you a pretty clear picture of how to approach this area. Now, what about written answers? Uh, sometimes we, we've been marking a couple of thousand papers at the moment, and sometimes it looks like this. Sometimes they're beautiful, clearly structured, really easy. Think about this. If, if you're writing for an examiner and you just write a great big essay with no headings, no structure, no flow, how are they going to mark it easily? It's very simple for them to actually miss a few marks, even if you understand it. So key thing is always have nice structure. Use some headings, break it up, and lay your points. I've marked quite a few papers in the last two days where people jump straight to the conclusion. They say, this is a breach of misleading and deceptive conduct, for example. How can you do that without going through the steps? Firstly, what is the issue? Hey, here we've got a scenario like that advertisement we saw where it might be misleading and deceptive. Then I have to tell about the law. Or it could be the ethical theories, or it could be the strategic tools. This is the law. Applying this to the case facts, and, and this is something students do wrong all the time. They say, this is a breach because of what happened in the case. 
guess what? The examiner doesn't know what happened in the case in that sense. They just see what you've written. You have to pull out the key case facts and demonstrate you understand. It, it's amazing how often people go, yeah, this is misleading because people were confused. Why were they confused? Who was confused? You need to specify the actual examples going on. And you'll be absolutely amazed that no one, I don't want to say no one, a large portion of people don't write a conclusion. They don't say, therefore, this is the outcome. This is ethical. Or this is a breach of the law. Or this is the strategic recommendation. Or this is what you should do next. They don't come to a conclusion. They just sort of fade away. A guaranteed way to miss out on, on what I would say obvious marks. You, you demonstrated you understand it, but you have to cover the key points. If you're asked to evaluate and come to a conclusion, that has to be part of the work you do. So we've looked at deconstructing MCQ. We've looked at guessing the exam question. Now we need to study effectively. And you'll see, anyone who's been doing our, our subjects will see that we, we follow a very systematic plan. It's about studying, mastery, keeping on track and doing work. So we focus on the weightings. We make sure, look at this ethics and governance, module three and four are worth 50% of your exam. So if you don't master these, and module three feeds into module four. If you don't get module three, you're in huge trouble. Then you do the practice exams, then you do your revision and the final. If you try and squeeze it all into these last two weeks, uh, it's really tough. And anyone who's just found module five, ethics and governance, you'll realize it's over a hundred pages. It's very complicated. It's hard to learn quickly. So we recommend using our study resources in, in sequence. So we always say, watch the short videos first. It's like, it's like watching the movie and then reading the book. It's so easy to read the book after you watch the movie because you can see what's going on. You know who the characters are. You can visualize what's going on and you fly through the story. So watch the short videos and give you a picture of what's going on very quickly in three to five minutes. Read the study guide, come to the webinar, do the module quiz and the practice exam. It's a pretty structured sequence and we find that this leads to extraordinary improvements in results across our, our student groups. Build your mind maps. And if you've done financial reporting or audit, the Arshan is the master of these. So what, what we always try and do is chunk the knowledge. And this comes from Ethics Governance Module 5. But what are the key chunks? It's 100 pages long, but what are the key areas? Because if you can break it down into little chunks, then you can say, do I know this? Do I know uh, sustainability? What's causing sustainability? If, if I do that, it's, I can say, I understand this area. I might not understand my ethical theories here. You know, it's got legitimacy theory and institutional theory, and it's a little bit complicated, but then you can highlight the areas you need to revise. Instead of reading the whole module, just target the difficult parts. So mind maps of what you're studying. And then we use flow charts, so capturing knowledge. And this is audit module four. And you can see that it's very complicated, but it's summarized in one row. So you can literally tick off key areas that you understand or don't understand or have studied through. And you can use this to solve a particular question or problem. So lots of students hold the flowchart up and they can solve a financial reporting question because it flowcharts them through the standard. Or they can solve an audit issue because it's got all the key facts instead of split over three pages or on a single page. So capturing flowcharts, writing little notes alongside and stepping through them calmly. You, you don't want to be using this flowchart the first time in the exam. But in the exam, you can say, oh, is it, you know, is it in this section? Is it a test of detail? Okay, I can calmly get that right. Here's one from Ethics and Governance, and it's, it's the ethical theories. And this is where you need to write your own notes. So you, you build a flowchart and then capture a couple of words alongside. So teleological is consequences. Deontological is based on your intention and your motive. Egoism is focused on the individual. Utilitarian is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So... If you're evaluating a situation, you need to know which perspective you're using and quickly capture those notes. So you can summarize a huge amount of, of content into just one page or two pages or into a graphic. Uh, another way of summarizing this co content in a, in, a, in a systematic way is using tables. So ethics and governance, we show this, there's about 15 pages of discussion about market systems and relationship systems. So this is trying to pull key things together so that you can Visualize one and compare it against the other. And this saves you time. Now, this isn't enough to master the material, but it's a really good summary revision point to help you through. So flowcharts, tables, mind maps, systematic. Here's another example of using a data and a table and, and putting together indexes and definitions that will really help you. 
One of the things we do a lot of, and I encourage you to do this, is think of stories. And you can do this by reading the newspaper, reading the financial pages. So the, the example here, this is from Rania Plaza, uh, the Bangladesh uh, textile disaster where where there was a, a building that was shown to have cracks and problems and people were still forced to go back into there. Now, when we read module five of ethics and governance, people find it a little bit dry, a bit theoretical, but it's based on stuff like this. It's based on lack of accountability where people haven't done the right thing in the supply chain because they're trying to save a little bit of money. They're trying to squeeze an extra dollar and the costs are horrendous. So by reading the stories, you get a better understanding of the theory. So all the time throughout our, our presentations, we're trying to give you pictures, images, things that when, when you read the study guide, it, it comes into your mind quickly and easily. And then the other thing I like to do is, is little roadmaps or threads. So this is module five ethics governance. 100 pages long, nine key chunks of content. Do I know accountability? What's driving it? Do I know what an externality is? It's a great question to get them all on. What are the ethical theories here? And, and a few students have been tested in this. Normative stakeholder theory, managerial. And, and some know it really well. Others don't even know what module I'm talking about. Measurement, what are the limitations of financial reporting? What are the reporting requirements that are coming out? You know, the GRI it might be, or integrated reporting. And how are we moving to a sustainable, uh, responsible type investment or socially responsible investment in natural capital? So by breaking down big, scary modules into smaller components, now all of a sudden we have nine topics. And then, you know, there might be 10 or 15 questions here. You can sort of say, well, how are these questions coming my way? How am I prepared? So the next step is we've, we've had a structured approach to studying, and that has to start at the start of semester. But then we get to the, is studying equal reading? I've, I've been reading and reading, but I can't remember anything. We hear this all the time. We need to read each page, but you also need to highlight, because you're going to have to come back. Virtually no one can remember what they've read the first time. It often takes up to seven times for that information to sink in. I'm not saying you have to read the study guide seven times, but you have to expose yourself to this information over and over. A lot of students skip answering the questions because they, they think, ah, oh, I don't know, I couldn't be bothered. They read the question, they read the answer, they say, that makes sense. But that's not the same as writing the answer yourself. So then when you get to a written exam and you say, oh, it was really tough, I didn't know what to say, you're paying the price for, for skipping, for cheating earlier on. So go through the questions and then write your own notes. It, it's funny on Facebook how often people say, give me your notes, I want your notes, here's my index. If you haven't created that index or written those notes, it's very hard for it to be helpful to you because most of the learning process is in the creation. When you read a paragraph and summarise it, when you determine what keywords you want in your index. So the reality is there's, there's no shortcuts to, to what we call thriving. And, and the aim is not just to survive. If your CPA program takes you three years, do you really want to be struggling for three years or do you want to be at least, maybe not enjoying it, but doing well? on top of things, in charge of your life and, and working through it systematically. So if you're going to summarise, it's more than reading. What we do, grab your major heading, start you know, in a study guide, read a paragraph and try and say, what is the one key point of this paragraph? Can I reduce that to one sentence? Because then if there's only four paragraphs on a page, you can collapse that to four or five lines of summary notes. You can shrink a 500 page study guide to only 30 pages of of summarised notes. That's going to help you revise faster, understand it better, and the, the actual act of reading and turning it into a sentence is where the deep learning takes place. So you can skip this process because you think you're saving time, but in the long term, it doesn't really help to skip it. What should you summarise? Well, you should make sure that your notes capture the key objectives. So here we've got one from, from Ethics Governance Module 5. Have you captured summary notes on the theories of organisational motives? And these include enlightened self-interest, they include institutional theory, legitimacy theory. Do I know them? You might only have to write one paragraph on each of them, but you're going to be examined on it because the exams are modules and the modules have objectives. And so you can predict that there are questions coming your way in this area. So make sure your summary notes capture these key themes. So from there, how, how do you summarise? We've, we've got some blog posts and things, so, so check these out. But here's an example from, from the Ethics Government Study Guide. You've got a, a chunk of text, you shrink it into four lines. 
So the act of shrinking helps you learn. And guess what? When it comes to revision, you only have to read four lines, not several paragraphs. And that means you can revise this you know, once a week for six or seven weeks until your exam. Deep, deep learning. So we're to final preparations. Start with at least 10 days to go. So, so a lot of students get to 10 days to go and they haven't even done the first round of study. Oh, that's a bit dangerous. So you should have done all of this hard work and got to revision time with 10 days. In a, in a 10 or 11 week semester, you're probably going to get sick for one week and work's going to be busy for at least one week. So you've got a plan for that. You can't blame anyone else for these problems. Assume you only have eight weeks. So get your study done systematically through the semester. Then you need to reread your highlighted text, reread your revision notes, reread those summaries, those indexes, and then review the objectives. Turn them into practice questions and say, can I answer this key item? If I can't answer it, I need to go back and revise. But if you can answer it, move on. Don't keep studying the areas you actually understand. We attempt every question. So this is a time for revision and practicing and, and really uh, working on recall, pulling the numbers and the ideas and the concepts out of your memory and bringing them forth so you can answer quickly. So here's an example we gave in ethics and governance at the start of semester. And most people will say yes or no, this is good or bad, but the aim here is to practice writing or typing out your answers because if you're going to get a written answer exam, you should practice it. The, the first time you start writing, if it's in the exam, you're, you're going to be very rusty. So the aim is we give you these pre-webinar questions, start writing your answers. Now, only about 5 or 10% of students actually do this, but they're the ones who thrive because they've done the hard work early on. And then when it comes to writing a good answer, their structure is better, their a theme of argument is better, they use the right concepts, and, and that's where the marks are. Uh, here's another example, uh, a warm-up question from Advanced Tax. But take the time to do the calculations. Where it's fascinating watching you at a couple of thousand students, you get a real feel for all the different types of behaviours. We've got the people who do all the work early, all the work at the last second, and everything in between. And the ones who don't do the work and hope they can just mysteriously, magically find a quick fix to get them through. And some of those students, they follow the same behavioural pattern semester after semester, which is kind of odd and kind of unusual. So answering some questions. I've been here a legal question or an ethical question. It can be a strategy question. It can be a business operations question. But you want to learn this in your undergraduate studies. Get the key issue. What's happened here? Have they got a costing issue? Have they got a, a strategic issue? Have they got a cultural problem? Have they got an ethical problem? Have they got a governance issue or are they breaking the law? Lots of different issues. Find out what it is, and, and that should be the first sentence. The issue here is, or the problem here is, then do we have the relevant law? And it might be, I've, I've used the word law, you know, and that's ethics governance, say module four. But it could be, what is the relevant ethical code? It might be APS 110, or it might be for financial accounting, what is the relevant uh, IFRA standard? So what is the relevant standard? What are the relevant paragraphs? Then apply the case facts to the law. In this scenario, here's the information. The law says this, this is acceptable or not. We do this with ethics, we do this with financial standards, whatever it might be. And then, as I've already said this point, so come to a conclusion, don't sit on the fence and, and don't be scared. Uh, here's a, an example of using a flow chart if you get a misleading and deceptive question. Start with the issue. This is the issue. Is the conduct misleading and deceptive? Then, what is the relevant law? So depending on jurisdiction, you may not say in Australia, Section 18, consumer law. Then we have to say, this kind of behaviour overall is prohibited if it doesn't create a truthful impression. How do we test that on less informed people? And we determine is it fair or deceitful? We can back that up with a little bit of case law and so you can see the structure of the question, issue, law, application, discussion, conclusion. If you follow this structure in virtually any type of question or scenario, your chances of performing well increase dramatically. Just another example with insider trading. We often see students who write, this is insider trading. And that's, that's the answer. And that's totally not good enough. If, let's say it's a five mark question, it's like one mark. So we have to start off with, have we got the issue of insider trading? What is that? So acting on inside information. What are the questions or tests or law? And then we have to look at the case facts. What has happened? Have we got this? Has the person acted on it? Yes, no, yes, no. Yes, there's a breach. No, there's not. So it's about being very systematic here. 
So we've got right up to just before the exam. Now we get to plan your time. Now, if you're doing tax, 60 questions, just over three hours, three minutes a question, right? So after you know 30 minutes, you should know exactly where you're up to. You would hope that you can plan your time very carefully. You need to watch the clock in 30 minute increments and make sure you are spending the right time per mark. I often recommend preparing an index and you'll see here it's in alphabetical order. So any question that has a word that you, you're a bit taken aback by, you can quickly scan, look it up. So you might not remember Basil III. You get the question, you turn to page 26, and you calmly reflect and make sure you have the answer right. Uh, I've already talked about preparing summary notes, but the other way to do uh, summary notes is to prepare an index. So that involves highlighting keywords in a study guide and then writing out a definition or a description. And, and here's an example from Ethics and Governance where we put down the page, the term, and because you get the PDF from my online learning, you can also find out what else it pops up throughout the study guide. And, and so what you have here is a really nice way of writing summary notes to help you remember the trickiest, most difficult words in the study guide. So what about notes? What about markups? You, you can take whatever little notes you want into the, into the exam. And uh, here's one of our employees who's done a lot of marking up and you'll notice all these little tags as well. So writing notes in the margin. I use different colored highlighters for different types of information. Everyone does what they like best, but summarize, notes, tagging, all of these are important. You want to be able to turn quickly to the correct page in the exam. Now, this is another one of my colleagues, and I would say this is probably a bit excessive for most people. So uh, I, I don't mind if you don't use uh, this amount of tagging, but that, that led to a pretty awesome result and a prize. So, so it was worth it. So again, coming towards the end, Good exam technique. So we've looked at good study technique, that gets you through the semester, then good revision just before the exam, then planning your exam, like watching the clock, making sure you've planned your time. Now you're in the exam, what do you do? Read, read the question. It's amazing how many people don't read it carefully and then they make a silly mistake. Look for things like not or most relevant or not accurate. And so reading it is critical. But people think, I don't have time, I'm in a hurry, quick, quick, quick. Well, if you get the answer wrong, because you misread it, you haven't saved any time at all. So take the time to read the question. Sounds obvious, but your heart rate will be up. Your nerves will be like this. Take a deep breath, calmly read it. And then note the key words. What are they asking you? Now read it once and maybe read it twice, because what most people do is they skim it and they're half reading the distractors, the options at the same time. And that clutters your mind because those distractions are plausible, they're engaging and you get distracted. So read it slowly, read it again, note the key. Then a key thing here is literally you don't want to look at the options, you want to see if you can figure out the answer yourself, especially if it's a calculation. But try if you can figure out the answer yourself, you can be very confident you know what's going on. Then you check the options, there it is, you won't get tricked or fooled. So try and think of the answer first, don't let the MCQs prompt you because they can distract you. Now we need to check the options. And my technique here is uh, people read from A, B, C, D. Now if A looks tempting, they circle it and they move on. The problem is A might be right, but not the most right. Or it might be really right, but it's got a little twist. You need to read each option. But when you're in a hurry and a panic, that's hard to do. So what I suggest is because it's unusual and it'll slow you down, Read from the bottom up. So that way you won't ever just get to option A and then go, oh, it must be A, quick, quick, quick. What you do is you start at the bottom and then you read the next one and then the next one and the next one. And that systematically makes you reflect and choose calmly. It is better to calm down for an extra 30 seconds and get the answer right than to panic and get distracted and get it wrong. Jump forward quickly is something that most people can't do, but you have to learn how to do it. So use our practice exams to get that skill. What it means is when you go through your paper, you should try and get as many marks as quickly as possible. Then you use the spare time to figure out the tricky areas. If you just do a few questions and stop on the tough ones, you might get to the end of the paper with 10 or 15 questions unanswered. And they might be easy ones that you knew. You need to earn all your easy marks first, which means if you look at a question and you really don't know the answer, don't spend five, 10 minutes figuring it out for one mark. Flag it, come back to it, 
and go and find all the good ones that you can get. So for example, for me in tax, I find pretty tough exams. So when I did this, it's about a decade ago, I start off and I work my way through There's 60 questions, 45 of them I could get straight away. So I just, anytime I couldn't do a calculation or I didn't know it or I was a bit rusty, turn the page, move on. And then at the end of that time, I've got you know, an hour left to do the last 15 questions. And it's like, okay, now I slowly work through the tough ones because I'm spending those extra minutes. And at the end of all of that, I didn't get through all the 15. There were probably three or four that I, I just couldn't get to. I ran out of time. But I know that I didn't miss out on any easy ones because I jumped quickly. Uh, a lot of students can't do this. They just feel like they have to work on the one question until they get it right. And, and for me, I've seen hundreds of papers where the written answer has not been answered because people have got caught on the multiple choice. And that's, you're guaranteed to get zero when you don't write anything. You, you can't even guess the answer, so you must jump forward quickly. And finally, I've said this a lot, time yourself. Figure out how many marks you should be achieving every 10 or 20 minutes or every 30 minutes and force yourself to accelerate because otherwise you get to the last hour. If you're way behind in the last hour, you will panic. You will then start making silly mistakes and you'll stop working properly and you're, you're pushing yourself under massive pressure. So before I talked about using the resources effectively, I'm going to talk about them one more time quickly. We have heaps of short videos, often 30 to 50, even 60 per, per subject. We recommend you watch them right at the start of semester. And, and that gets you the, the concepts in your mind, often three minutes, four minutes long. So you watch the video, there might be a quiz or a PDF, and that's setting the scene, getting you ready to read the study guide. Read the study guide, tag, highlight, get familiar. Then come along to our webinars, and the webinars, you, you shouldn't come to the webinar to learn from scratch. We are assuming you've read the study guide and you've watched the video. So we go very quickly because it's like a, a revision webinar where you're going over the key thing. You can ask your questions if you're in the live one and we, we solve your problems. If you're not in the live one, those of you who've been enrolled, you'll see this. So you'll see the 10 weeks of, of content, the PDF slides are available. You can watch it at any time. So all the resources are there, but use this more for revision and then use the module quiz to, to test if you know it. Then the end of the semester comes along, sign up for a, a practice exam, get involved and then practice them, do them, get the feedback. Now, there's a key rule with the practice exams. And here's an example here. A lot of students, there's never a good day to do a practice exam, so they delay, delay, delay until it's too late. We even had students doing it on the last day, like actually on the day of their exam, in the morning for an afternoon exam. That's a waste of time. It's too late. Uh, you're not going to get any benefit because you can't do any revision and you're going to be exhausted. It should be maybe the day before or two days. It should be two weeks before for the first one and then a week before for the second. So, you know, for example, if you took the exams on, on Saturday, that's tomorrow for some of you, you should have done the first practice exam on the 30th and the second one on the 7th because you do an exam, you get the feedback, you go and revise and learn and practice for a week and then you do the next one. And that way, if you get sick or you get busy at work, you've got a safety buffer to get yourself through. So if you didn't follow this process this semester, we're going to encourage it even more heavily next semester. But So if your exams are on Sunday the 30th, do one on the 15th, one on the 22nd. You might say, I don't feel ready. I don't care. Do it. You will never be ready. This forces you to set a date, sit down, do the work. You probably will sur surprise yourself as well. So check out this, this structure. The more systematic you are, in your, your structure, your study in the semester, the greater the success you're going to have. Now, last night we ran this and it was absolutely amazing. The chat box went totally bananas and uh, I managed to, I think, answer every question. If you have any questions, obviously you can't type in the chat box now because we're re-recording this, but you can email me, you can email the team and we can help you out. So there's one final thing, uh, jump in, grab a value pack and uh, keep supporting us, keep in telling everyone else about us, the, the more people that know about us and the more people sign up, the more resources we create, the more help we can do and uh, just keep giving us your feedback and letting us know how things are going. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Good luck with your exams. They start tomorrow. It's uh, been a whirlwind 10 weeks of semester and I wish you all the best. Have a great night. Thanks.